Bridland shoes come in an ocean blue shoe box with a protective foam top layer, a minimalist wooden shoehorn, and an extra pair of round laces as an alternative to the flat ones that come pre-laced. These are the mainline straight tip Oxfords in dark brown. They come in these shoe bags. Do you see these shoe bags? We're gonna talk about them later, but first, I have an affiliate deal with Bridland! Wow. Um. Which is awesome, by the way. Guys, can you believe it? I can't believe I'm actually doing it. I'm, gonna, I, I'm actually gonna be a YouTuber. Not the kind that grooms children, though. I, I, I just use them for free labor. Inside, outside, good and the bad. Guys, today we are going to cover everything you could possibly want to know about. Oh, and if you appreciate my work and want to support the channel, the best way to do that, guys, is by using my affiliate links. You don't have to, but if you do, Thank you so much. I really, really genuinely actually appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Starting off with a half leather, half rubber top lift, a sign of craftsmanship you'd usually see at or above about $350, the same of which could be said about the full vegetable tan leather heel stack. Already we're off to a really strong start from a material standpoint. Up again, we have a full vegetable tanned leather outsole. These are chestnut pit tanned in Tuscany. This is a closed channel sole. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. And then up again to the front of the shoe, we have the Goodyear welted cross section, you can see the sole stitch, which connects the outsole to the welt, and then the welt stitch that connects the welt through the upper, through the toe stiffener, through the lining, and then through a piece of leather that's actually cut off from the insole. This reflects a notably unique way to execute a Goodyear welted construction shoe, and we will talk a little bit more about that when we touch on the insole, but for now, we are going to move to the cork layer. Pretty standard, it's not the most tight, dense cork pack we've seen on the channel, nice. but it's definitely filled in properly. The next component is this really interesting black fiberboard bit here. Now, this is a pretty unique feature that you very rarely see on Goodyear welted shoes, and that is because this insert here is what allows for the shoe to have the bevel on the underside of the sole, something we'll talk a little bit more about later. Now, in bespoke shoes, this is often done using sheet cork or leather, where they actually shape that material to form that either ridge or hump or whatever it is. But here, this is a way in which you can achieve that aesthetic quality without needing the high order of skill or cost that's associated with doing it in a traditional bespoke way. So kind of an interesting manufacturing method. And then up again, we have a shank here, actually the first shank of its kind that we've seen on Dresswell. This is a combination leather and steel shank at the highest order of shanks. You see either wood, which you see a lot in bespoke shoes, has that stiffness, that rigidity, but also has enough bend. And then you have steel, which is of course very structurally sound, but it can only extend so far because if it extends so far into the forefoot, it will start to cause stiffness in the shoe because it won't bend at all. So kind of an interesting and I would say somewhat innovative approach to that facet of the footbed. And then you'll notice there's this gap formed in the shank. This is due to the shank actually having a third dimension. It kind of has a hump, a ridge to it, probably to help prevent lateral movement of the shank within the shoe. You can't see it now because it all came out from the sander, but that gap I've seen filled with just kind of like a sandy substance they pack in. Then up again, we have that insole, which you'll notice is notably thick compared to other insoles we've seen. And a big part of that is because Bridlin does a channeled insole technique for their Goodyear welted construction. Now, what that means is instead of having a canvas rib that is glued, to the insole like most Goodyear welted shoes. Birdland actually does a technique that is typically used in hand welted shoes where the insole is actually cut and a small flap is formed from that cut and the welt is then stitched through that flap of insole as opposed to the gimmick. And now this allows for a couple things. Number one is it in theory results in a more solid durable construction because instead of having this rib that's glued to it, you actually have a stitch that is driven through and attached to the insole itself. So that's number one. Number two is that in order to even do that method, you'd need in the first place a thick insole. And so having a thick insole allows for the shoe to, in theory, have more padding and more comfort over time. I have to say, it's really impressive to have a full leather insole at this price. I mean, 
I wouldn't be surprised to see shoes have part leather, part synthetic, maybe just like a thin leather or maybe a cheap kind of stiff leather. And then this thin layer of fiberboard, I actually wasn't sure what this did. So I asked Bridlin and here's what Afan, the head shoemaker, had to say about it. And just below the charcoal foam, what you're seeing there is a very thin layer of board we use. So the back part of the insole, because we use a very thick but soft insole for the channeling and for the comfort in the front, what it does is it makes the back part of it when we're shaping the heel just that little bit more difficult. But by adding a little bit of this harder board at the back, we get a nice beautiful uh, shape to the heel. We're able to hammer it down real nice. So it's something we did more recently, I would say in the last year or so. I hope this helps. Thanks for putting out this video. See you soon in New York. Take care. Bye-bye. Of course, you can see they're probably a little zealous with nailing in the fiberboard. And then the pour-on heel pad. It's just kind of a normal charcoal foam. And then up again, we have the actual sock liner, which is a piece of leather just the same as the upper. And then the lining, pretty standard calfskin lining. It's actually quite clean. There's no bubbling, no separation that I've been able to find. It does get a little bit dirty up at the toe area at the front. The underside of the tongue, however, is not dyed. You can see it just bleeds off into that standard chrome tan blue tint. Let's see, no suede heel counter does have a leather board heel counter though, which is pretty darn good. It's like a graham cracker or some shit. I just want to eat it. Hey, you see that? It just pops back. Isn't that cool? Great structure. Totally could be Celastic at this price. And that does matter. Having leather board will just fit break in a little bit easier, fit a little bit better over time. And then the French binding, pretty standard, tightly stitched here. You can see there's no gaps, there's nothing loose. God, that's really, that is really glued on there. Oh my God, they did a really good job with this one. Ah. Oh my God, well there you can see it. Can you see it in focus? Oh my God, there, was that worth it? Was it worth it? Is that important for you to see? And then the upper leather itself. This is Vegano box calf from Anane. One of the best tanneries in the world. Some of my favorite leathers have come from Anane. And I have to say, it's great, right? It's like a super high quality leather. It's really clean all over. It's actually kind of surprisingly clean. Like I would have expected it to be a little bit worse. It has a uniform pore structure all throughout. I think it's actually quite beautiful and looks really nice in the light. We'll talk more about imperfections in that section, but you guys can kind of just see from the footage. I mean, the shoes, they look great. We'll see how it feels in the fit and comfort section, but you can even just see from the cross section, it's a pretty soft leather. So I'm not really expecting there to be a particularly intense break-in period. For those of you who have bought Bridlin, I would love to know. If you could leave a comment, I'd be happy to hear what your experience has been. At this point, I want to take a brief intermission to talk about something that isn't important at all, but by now I assume you're invested enough to pretend that you care. This is a shoe bag. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Without my shoe bag, I am not You put your shoes in them so they don't collect dust when you're not wearing them. These bags are for $200 shoes. These bags are for $2,000 shoes. You know what they both have in common? They're not shaped like fucking shoes. See this? See this? This gives me hemorrhoids. These are Bridlin's shoe bags. Not only are they shaped like a shoe, but they also have a rounded side and a straight side so you know which is left and right. So why does this matter? It's like, well, I guess it kind of doesn't. But that's exactly why it does to me. Nobody would care if they did a normal shoe bag. Nobody asked for this but they did it anyway. And that tells me that these are people who are thinking critically, not about how do I squeeze every penny I can out of my customers, but rather how do I improve every facet of the consumer experience I possibly can and run a successful business in so doing. I think genuinely striving to improve the lives of other people is not only not mutually exclusive with running a successful business, 
But that mentality is in fact mandatory to creating, to innovating a superior product. And this channel exists to find and celebrate through the practice of disciplined, honest, meticulous scrutiny, the people and companies that have that spirit and root out the ones that don't. Even if you don't care about that kind of thing, more pragmatically, I think small signs of honest, sincere intention indicate a lower probability of having a negative consumer experience overall, right? Like if they care enough to optimize the shape of a shoe bag, they probably care enough to give you good customer service. Let's talk about design. Let's start with last design. These are Indian last, and I wanna make that important distinction because it is an Indian company, and I think it's important to give credit to that. That said, these are very reminiscent, I would say, of more straightforward English lasts, and really in some sense of American lasts. It actually reminds me a lot of Beckett Simonon. It reminds me a lot, actually, of Allen Edmonds. I feel like this is the shoe that Allen Edmonds would be making if the spirit of the original founder of the company was still with it. The whole essence of the shoe is something that's big. It's got kind of a, a visual weight to it and a heaviness. It's got kind of a width to it. It has that no frills, durable, tanky stomper aesthetic that many people seem to like in Allen Edmonds, but they're actually well made and designed in a way that is cohesive and refined, even within the aesthetic context of a shoe that's unassuming and modest. There's not a bunch of flashy curves like you might see on TLB Mallorca or angles like you might see on Eastern shoes like Yearn or Acme, but it's also not so basic as something like Beckett Simonon, right? It still does have an asymmetry to it. it, still does have really good proportions and certain curves that just elevate it. And insofar as it has that kind of heavier, more straightforward aesthetic, I think this is really what a lot of American audiences would like. And that's part of why I originally planned for it to be in this trilogy of shoes with Yearn, TLB Mallorca, and Bridlin, because I think Bridlin is kind of that missing third component of what a standard buyer might want that they might not get with those two other companies, both in price and aesthetic. Anyways, let's get into the details. The stay stitch is very well done. It's definitely a little better on one shoe than the other. As far as overall stitching quality and cleanliness, it looks pretty solid to me. Everything's very uniform, very tightly stitched. There is one loose thread on the interior lining, but other than that, that's all the defects I've been able to find. Even on the welt, I couldn't find any loose stitching, and we usually see at least one of those on there. They've gone with just a simple curve here for the decorative stitch that complements the lacing, and then the eyelets themselves graduate in width as they go down the shoe. Again, kind of a sign of quality that we see in higher end shoes. I wanna point out guys, just why it's important that these eyelets graduate because it actually reflects this curve that you have here coming down the side of the shoe. And so that duality, that sort of mirroring is one way in which we can examine the aesthetic quality, the thoughtfulness of design in a product. It's these small aesthetic choices that all add up to create and a, a beautiful product, a beautiful work of art. As far as the laces themselves, they have these thin laces. These are flat laces that they come with. They do come with round laces as an alternative. I can see what they're trying to do with having these very thin, narrow laces. A thinner lace, it's going to complement a very kind of thin, elegant shoe. I'm actually not sure I'm entirely sold on that with this shoe though. I, I actually think just a normal flat lace would work much better with this overall shoe, given the overall aesthetic itself is already a little bit wider, a little bit sort of bigger. I think that having these thin laces kind of contrast with the overall aesthetic of the shoe in a way that isn't particularly cohesive. 
Although I'm curious what you guys think. Now the stitch density of the uppers is 14 stitches per inch, which is pretty incredible, actually. I mean, you would expect to see between $300 and $400, a stitch density somewhere between like eight and 12. So 14 is already a huge jump and adds to that overall refined craftsmanship of the shoe. Similarly, the stitch density on the welt is seven stitches per inch. And guys, when I'm referencing, Goodyear welted shoes over $300. The reason I'm making that comparison as opposed to 250 is because Goodyear welted shoes really only start above $300. There's a few companies and we'll, we'll talk about that later, but there's not really a substantive enough market that I can say like, oh, this is what it normally is at 250. And then on the welt, we have this beautiful welt fudging here. It's not particularly deep, which is normally a concern, especially on cheaper shoes, because it often leads to fading and inconsistency in the pattern. That doesn't appear to be an issue here though. On Goodyear welted shoes, welt fudging doesn't have any purpose outside of simply being aesthetic. And because it's still done uniformly, I think insofar as its purpose is to visually frame the upper, I think it achieves that purpose. And then there's also just a slight bevel on the edge of the welt as well, which I think adds another layer of visual interest for light to sort of bounce off of. As far as leather joinery goes on the shoe, you have the welt joint. It is exactly where you typically want to see it on the interior of the shoe where it's not noticeable. This joint is actually probably among the best joints we've seen on the channel. I mean, this is super smooth. It's basically impossible to see almost, although you can see they're cut unevenly such that there ends up being kind of this large bump here. As far as the sole edge where the outsole meets the welt, I can't catch my fingernail on it. So the sanding is pretty good, but you definitely can see it if you look for it. And then you can actually see these dual cut ridges here. These two lines kind of complement the overall aesthetic just by adding almost a decorative touch. I didn't even know if it was intentional. And I actually asked Bridlin and they showed me the reason that these two ridges occur is because of how the edge of the outsole leather is cut with this certain tool that results in those ridges. Was it intentional from a design perspective? Like probably not, but it ends up being kind of a nice aesthetic addition. One of those things that's more personal opinion. I'm curious what you guys think. Maybe you don't like it. Back to the heel stack. It is mostly perfectly flush, although there are a couple areas where I can just barely catch my fingernail. And then you'll notice just this overall finishing on the heel and sole edge. So this is something that's totally unique. We haven't seen this at all in the channel. I rarely see this at all on any shoes. I mean, these shoes are finished with almost like a a, literally a mirror shine finish on the heel and sole edge. I just think that's great. I think it's a really cool touch. And again, one of these small things that at least to me, I mean, maybe you guys think I'm just shilling, but I mean, I, I, I think it's an indication that these are people who are really trying to like push extra quality into their product in whatever way they reasonably can at their price point. And then on top of that, just from a durability standpoint, I mean that there's this shined wax layer on the heel does mean that it's going to be a little more waterproof right out the gate. Super cool. I think that's, I think that's super cool. Sorry. Maybe I'm like, a, I like have, I have to, oh God, we're falling apart here. I have to like, okay. I have to figure out if I'm going to even include that in the video. I probably shouldn't. Okay, so the evenness of the heel layers themselves, they are totally even, which is great. Of course, you have that top layer that tapers off as is normal. The heel block is cut tight to the shoe, falling nicely within the width of the upper. And then there is heel wheeling, just adding another decorative touch to what would otherwise be a plain surface on the heel block. Moving down to the heel nails will help with the durability as the heel wears down, it's wearing down these brass tacks, but mainly it's there as a decoration. Again, something that you really wouldn't expect to see until you get kind of over $350. And then the gentleman's notch, something that I personally have gone from feeling indifferent about to actually disliking from an aesthetic standpoint. That's a personal opinion though. More objectively, it is considered a sign of craftsmanship and intention. And then you have this die work here, which goes around the edge of the shoe, just as again, another decorative compliment. I also really like that there's dye on the gentleman's notch as well, just kind of helps blacken that surface. You've got the imprinted logo stamp here on the bottom, and then the finishing of the sole, a nice, modest wax gloss. And then the waist width is actually two and three quarters of an inch. Now between three and four hundred dollars, you would typically see something like two and a half. You wouldn't want to see it over two and a half. It's part of what contributes to the overall wider footprint and sort of wider aesthetic 
of the shoe. And then you have closed channel stitching, which I think is one of the highlights of this whole product. You know, it's nice from an aesthetic standpoint. It's also nice knowing that the sole stitch, which is one of two primary stitches connecting the whole shoe together, is protected by that flap of leather. Again, something that you normally see kind of at or above $400. And the sole bevel we spoke about earlier, where the sole isn't just flat across on the waist, it actually has a slight curve, which is sort of a call to bespoke shoes that typically have a fiddle back waist where it comes up to a point. The reason this is so nice, I think, is because from a sculptural standpoint, it just sort of creates this aesthetic continuity where you have the roundness of the entire upper. And then instead of it just being flat here on the bottom, that roundness actually continues and sort of wraps around the whole shoe. And then in addition to that, you have the beveled waist, which is where the sole edge itself goes from a square edge to a rounded edge, kind of continuing that continuity. Now, Bridlin on the outside actually has a squared off edge here. So this side is not beveled, but the interior is. And I actually asked them, I was like, is this a cost thing or is it a design thing, right? Which is at this price, it's you know pretty fine if it's a cost thing. And they actually said, no, this is a design choice we make. And I, I think that's a really interesting choice because it's like, I don't know if I like it or don't like it, Again, we're talking about a really subtle facet of the design here, so it's hard to have like a super strong opinion about it. I think there's kind of an interesting thematic thing where like the exterior of the shoe is this rigid squared off edge and it's kind of like the exterior is supposed to be protective and hard and rigid where the interior is kind of thematically more vulnerable and sensitive. And so roundness is kind of an aesthetic reflection of those themes. And so I think there's like, something interesting from a narrative standpoint when we talk about like the narrative of aesthetics and then part of why i think it can work on the shoes because the shoe itself already has a kind of bigger heavier geometry to it now that said you could also say oh well i just think it looks kind of incomplete and half done and i don't think that's an unfair thing to say I'm curious what you guys think, but the second to last note is on the backstay, which they've gone just with a classic dog tail here. I think it looks great. I think the heel stitch itself has a really nice pattern to it, a really nice design. And then lastly, the wax finish. This product comes basically pre-shined in some sense, right? So it's got a semi-gloss shine all over it, a little more matte on the toe, and then kind of more glossy on the heel. A hand done wax finish by the shoemaker is something we normally only see on very high end shoes. I myself don't know of any stitch shoemaker that does this even under $400. So that's pretty cool. I'm glad they didn't go overboard with it. Honestly, these days, guys, I'm just not that big on glossy shines, mirror shines. I find them to be more of a maintenance liability than a boon. I think one or two light layers is nice for both the protection and the vibrance and the light. But beyond that, especially for a leather as nice as this, like, I don't really want to cover it up. <laughs> There's a protrusion on the welt on the interior of the forefoot. There's messiness where the top heel stack layer meets the welt. There's messiness where the wax finishes on the heel. That mm, kind of sucks. There's a dye stain on the interior arch. Perfect <laughs> infection. Imper <clears throat> There's an imperfect infection on the toe exterior side. There's messy finish under the laces. There's a dye stain on the exterior side. There's scuffs on the toes. Subtle leather creasing exterior and welt punching at the what? <laughs> On the right shoe, there's leather. It's just kind of fighting the cat heel counter on the exterior. There's a die on the interior arch. There's an extra heel layer slice under the welt joint. I'm not sure what that's there for. <gasps> I'm sorry, I need to think of the other breath. There's a notch in the leather on the heel. There's a scuff on the exterior forefoot. The notch kind of sucks. There's die stains on the interior lining. Glue stretching up from the sock liner, cratering on the top lift bottom, and a single crater on the exterior of the heel sack. <laughs> <coughs> oh, God. On both shoes, there's a logo stamp is uneven. Actually, that's only really on one shoe. The heel wheeling kind of sucks pretty bad. The gentleman's notch is weak. It's there, it's fine. It just seems a little bit weak to me. The finish around the logo kind of sucks. There's a bump on the welt joint. I know I just took a breath there. I kind of need it. <gasps> The heel nails are lacking polish. They just look kind of muddy. There's a loose lining stitch. There is a tiny hole punch on the interior of the heel counter. There's also one at the bottom that you can't see from the picture. Where the top lift meets the leather half. <gasps> I'm sorry, I need to breathe. 
where the top lift meets the leather, there's just like a little flappy thing that, you know, it's not great. Then there is gaps in the cross section of the shoe. So there's a gap at the toe, there's a gap at the heel. They're small, but you know, they're not ideal. There's also a gap on the midfoot, just adjacent the shank on the other side, basically of the shank. It is good that it's not in the cork. It's not gonna like rub away at the cork or whatever. It's just leather on leather, but like, you know, there's gaps and they, you know, shouldn't be there. <coughs> Ow. That's all the small stuff you may or may not even notice. Thankfully, there aren't any big issues that I see here, though there are a couple ones that really ruffle my feathers. Oh god, it smells awful. It smells really dreadful here. Uh, this dye work on the bottom that borders the sole edge, I love the idea. I think it's a great compliment to the shoe, but it's just not executed right. I mean, it literally looks like someone tried to draw this on with a Sharpie, right? Which, like, I don't know that's the worst thing in the world. I mean, Sharpie's probably not far from an alcohol-based dye, but it's like, it shouldn't look that way, right? And so it's one of those things where it just makes the shoe look kind of insincere. And, like, the reason I throw fuss about it is because, like, it, it would be better just to not be there. Right, like you could just not do that. The finish on the sole is already really nice. I don't wanna say don't do it, right? But it's like either do it and do it right or just don't do it at all. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about it. And then there's this roundness on the sole bottom. So guys, it's normal for shoes to have a little bit of roundness in the forefoot. It's called the toe spring. It kind of helps with that rocking motion as you step forward, kind of just helps move your body forward. But this is just like, kind of a lot. This does not seem like a normal amount of toe spring. Like it's still stable. It still has three point stability at least. Like the heel is totally stable. But we'll see how it actually feels in a moment when I try them on. So the question is, are the shoes still worth it? Well, that's not really for me to decide. I'm just here to help you better understand what you're likely to get if you choose to do so. What I will say though, is that I don't really know of anywhere else you could get something like this for the price. Some brands that immediately come to mind are Skolix out of Sweden. There's also Blackbird out of India. Solid shoes, definitely a step down from Bridlin, but still a really good value for $150. Meerman is probably the closest alternative. After shipping, it'll probably be about 10 to $35 cheaper than Bridlin. I think Bridlin's a step up from them and definitely worth the extra cost. But if you're on a tight budget, I don't think you're going wrong with Meerman by any means. There may be others. I'll try to put a resource down below. Uh, but those are the ones that pop to mind as kind of the paragon of, you know, value in that sub $300 range. One, two, three. So it's been about a week now that I've been wearing them. The fit is pretty solid, nothing too notable. The break-in period was mild, if not normal. There was some stiffness, most notably around the top line where it sort of dug into my ankle a little bit. It's pretty normal for me with all dress shoes. My TLB Mallorca's actually took closer to a week for that part of the shoe to relax, where these just took a couple days. And then the footbed was pretty stiff, fairly normal, and honestly not particularly surprising given the thick insole and the leather shank. It wasn't really uncomfortable, but I did definitely notice it, and you probably will too. Maybe it's a con for some people, but I think there's something kind of satisfying about feeling a shoe break in when the stiffness is a direct result of being constructed with such a solid, durable footbed. Very similar, I imagine, to the satisfaction one gets from breaking in something like a Nyx boot. The toe spring was about as awkward as I expected. Be careful because these are super slippery when you first put them on because of that basically pinhead sized contact point on the sole bottom. Thankfully, they settled out pretty quickly. You can actually see the wear pattern on the sole bottom after just a couple days. Between the footbed flattening out and me probably just getting used to it, I don't notice it anymore. Arch support doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but if it does to you, you'll probably like these because it is pretty pronounced here. More so than any of my other shoes, I can really feel the footbed sort of raise up in that arch area. It makes it feel kind of snug in the midfoot, which I quite like. It took about two to three days of wearing them just a few hours a day for the stiffness to go away. And after a week, they feel great. As far as styling, I think the defining feature of the shoe is probably its versatility. Again, back to this idea of a uh, Americana aesthetic, a product that is refined and well-made, but still exudes an almost 
rugged boot-like casualness. The broad last is a big part of that, but even small details like the half beveled waist all contribute to a little more of a down to earth look. What's cool about these is that unlike my TLB Mallorcas and especially my Yearns, these shoes look great in a suit while still also feeling very at home with a business casual outfit and honestly even jeans. I mean, they'll probably work well for just about any outfit that could work well with an Oxford. That said, if I had a fancy cocktail party or something to go to, while I could wear these, I'd probably stick with the other two because they're a little more flashy, sophisticated, and expensive. But those points, especially that last one, is also why I don't wear those shoes that often. I think part of the versatility of Bridlin shoes, not only in style, but just in overall use context, is the fact that they're not $500 and are also made in a way that feels like they're really meant to last, you know, and it'll look good with wear. I'd probably wear these as like a day in, day out workhorse kind of shoe, specifically because A, they look great, B, I don't have to think too hard about the rest of my outfit, and C, I don't have to be anxious about wearing them out or maybe get caught in the rain or, you know, something like that. Although to be honest, these days I'm more kind of a loafers guy. I have something to show you guys. You may have noticed the audio is substantially better on this video. I have to thank my patrons and those of you who use my affiliate links. Ta-da! Would you look at all of that acoustic treatment? It's beautiful. It's like the Batcave. If Batman was 5'5 five five and had a social disorder. Thank you for your support. It means the world to me. This movie sucked.